So today we're going to examine a claim made about the planet Earth that you may have heard before about how the Earth is built and what it does. Now if you were to take the Earth and slice it in half and sort of take a look inside, sort of dissect it, what you would find is that the Earth is actually made out of layers. And these layers have distinct properties. On the very outside we have the crust, under that we've got the mantle, and then we have the outer core and the inner core. And that mantle, you might have heard, is actually moving around. Mm -hmm. Now this is a pretty gutsy claim, and so it requires some gutsy evidence. But how do scientists mm -hmm. even know this? You can't see the mantle, it's too deep. Mm -hmm. Why would it move in the first place? So today we're going to examine this bizarre claim and see what we can figure out. In this video, your goals are to be able to use a model to explain how and why the Earth's mantle moves, explain how heat drives this process, and identify specific phenomena on the Earth's surface that are caused by this process. Now the Earth's crust is broken up into huge slabs of rock, and these are called tectonic plates. Now depending on your classification scheme, there's about seven major plates, ten minor ones, and five dozen of what are called microplates, and they move slowly, about one centimeter per year. And this is all well and good, but it still leaves us with our central question about why and how the mantle is moving around. Well, let's do a little clever investigation to see if we can figure this out. So we need some heat, so here's a hot plate to provide that heat, and let's set something on it, let's say a pie tin. Now we're going to break up this flat surface with some coins to provide a few different sources of heat. We're going to add a fluid, something that will flow. Here we've mixed a little shampoo uh, and water that will simulate our flowing mantle. And away we go! Now, this seems a little slow, let's go ahead and speed things up a little bit. There we go. So take a moment to just watch what the fluid is doing, especially around the coins. Those little beads make it easier to see what's happening. Now here's a good example, but keep in mind that all the coins are really doing the same thing. Now if you're observant, you'll notice that the fluid is actually flowing away from the coins. Now before we try to figure out what's going on here, let's recall a few facts about fluids. So let's take a blob of fluid here. It doesn't really matter what the fluid is, as long as it flows, that's what makes something a fluid. Now you might recall that any object, including a fluid, is made out of little particles, molecules, or atoms. And these molecules or atoms are zipping around, they're vibrating. And as these particles zip and move around, they produce a force, and that force is applied outward towards the edges of our blob of fluid. Now suppose that we applied a little bit of heat to our fluid. This is going to make our fluid expand, and the reason for that is because our particles are zipping around faster, and so they impart a greater force, and they take up more space. So we have the same amount of mass, the number of particles hasn't changed, but it's spread out in more space. And this is actually why a hot air balloon floats. So let's go on a tangent for a moment and try to figure out why this works. So our hot air balloon is floating in the air. Now the air is a fluid. Just like any fluid, our air is made out of particles, and these are air molecules. And they're cooler, which means that they're more dense because they're not vibrating around as fast. But it's called a hot air balloon for a reason. It's filled with hot air. So our air molecules in the balloon are hotter, and that means that they're less dense. Now that denser, cooler air presses against the balloon because all those particles are bouncing against it, and our sum total force actually ends up being upward. We call that the buoyant force. And that buoyant force is greater than gravity, which is why our balloon floats upward. But what we're really trying to do is to figure out how and why the mantle flows, so we have to develop a model of what's going on in our pie tin. So here's our pie tin from the side, and remember we place those coins in the bottom of the pan in order to provide these little sources of heat. Now remember we're talking about fluids here, and our fluid is made out of these little particles. And if you have a blob of particles sitting above one of those sources of heat, it expands. And as it expands, its density decreases. And so just like our balloon, that buoyant force is greater than the force of gravity. And as a result, our fluid begins to rise. And there's a name for this. This process in which heat causes a fluid to rise is called convection. Con means together, and vection means to carry. 
and there are convection currents above each of our sources of heat. But that leaves us with a natural enough question. If that fluid is rising away from the coin, that means there's an empty space left just above that coin. So what happens is that the fluid at the bottom of the pan comes rushing in toward the coins in order to fill that empty space. We can illustrate that in our model. And as it approaches our heat source, it heats up, expands, and rises. So we've got all kinds of rising fluid, but does the fluid ever sink? Well, if you look closely, you'll see that it does. As the fluid moves away from the coins, it actually sinks back down toward the bottom. So let's add this to our model. So as our fluid rises, it cools off because there's not as much heat up there. And as it cools, it becomes more dense, and therefore it sinks. So our fluid falls back down toward the bottom of the pie tin. So we end up with these rotating circular shapes, and these rotating circular shapes have a name. They're called convection cells. And in this case, our model that we've developed, we actually have six of them. But what we really want is to apply this model to our moving Earth. So this is going to take some cosmetic changes. <laughs> So here's those convection cells that we modeled in our pie tin. And they exist in the first place because that mantle is flowing. And in some areas on Earth, the mantle is rising and so it diverges or spreads, and in other places it's coming together, and so it sinks. Now here's where things get a little scary. So you know about volcanoes and earthquakes and things like that, right? Mm-hmm. Well, it turns out that we can actually use mantle convection, those convection cells, to sort of predict where earthquakes and volcanoes will show up on the planet Earth. So remember that there's some places on Earth where the mantle is rising because it's heating up. And then there's other places where it's cooling off and sinking. So let's zoom in on one of these areas and see if we can't figure out what's going on. We've got our brittle crust, and then we have our mantle that's flowing underneath. Because it's cooling off, it's sinking. And the force of that flowing mantle is so strong that it actually drags the crust down into the Earth. And we can even predict which one of the plates will get dragged down. It's the one that's denser. And there's a perfectly logical name for this process. It's called subduction. The prefix sub means from below, and duction means to draw, pull, or drag. And so this is a subduction zone. Now let's go ahead and zoom in even further to the subduction zone to figure out what's going on. So we've got our two plates. We've got our upper plate on the left and our subducting plate on the right. And remember, these are moving because the mantle is flowing. It's sinking in this area. So as that plunging plate sinks down into the mantle, it builds up a lot of friction. And once in a while, that friction is released in one big jerk. And we call that an earthquake. And this is interesting for the geologists, but not very cool for the people who live at these subduction zones. Now there are other things going on at these subduction zones. So if you look at that plunging plate, it's hot down there in the mantle. And so that heat actually melts some of that crust. And so just like any other fluid that you warm up, it starts to rise right through the crust in what are called magma plumes. And these magma plumes will actually push through the surface of the crust. And this is what we call a volcano. Interesting for volcanologists, not for the people who live there. Now up to this point, we've assumed that one of the plates is denser than the other, but what if that's actually not the case, and the plates have the same density? Hmm. We know that the denser plate is going to subduct, so if they have the same density, neither one can do that. So what they do is they sort of bunch up in this sort of accordion shape, and we experience that as mountains. And you might hear this called kind of an unusual word. It's orogeny. Oro means mountain, and geni means origin or creation. Now what about these places under the crust where the mantle is actually diverging because it's welling up? It doesn't really seem to make sense that you would have either a subduction zone or mountains here because the plates are actually moving away from each other. Well, the result of this divergent boundary is actually pretty incredible. So that magma breaks through the surface and forms brand new crust. And normally we see this happening at the bottom of the ocean, and so we call this seafloor spreading. So let's take a moment to review what we've learned so far. We observed those rotating circular shaped structures that are driven by heat that we called convection cells. And we observed those in our pie tin. When the convection cells in the mantle drag tectonic plates toward each other, sometimes we can get subduction. 
Here we find earthquakes and volcanoes. If the plates are of equal density, we get what's called an orogeny, or a mountain building event. And lastly, there are those divergent zones, where mantle flowing to the surface spreads apart and actually breaks through to the surface to create a new crust in what we call seafloor spreading. So let's double check our goals and make sure we can do them all. You should be able to use a model to explain how and why the Earth's mantle moves, explain how heat drives this process, and identify specific phenomena on the Earth's surface that are caused by this process. But science isn't just about answers, it's also about questions. So what kind of questions can you come up with about this topic? We'll give you a few seconds to think about it. Well, here's a few questions that we came up with. Why is it so hot deep in the Earth? Where is all that energy from? Do volcanoes happen anywhere else besides subduction zones? And what would make them occur? What about earthquakes? Do they need a subduction zone for them to happen? And how long do these processes take? How many years? And what did the Earth look like billions of years ago? Until next time.